to have this um, conversation and uh, I think it is um, wonderful that um, now we are having this conversation virtually because we've had many more people join us um, from further afield and I'm excited to be able to do that. Um, what we're going to do, I'm going to share my, my screen just so we can start to look at the wonderful images here. So bear with me as I cue this up. Okay, and I think everyone can, can see that. Um, what we are going to talk about today is um, Adrian's exhibition which has been called Two Sides of a Dream. And it is part of our Women Take Wilson exhibition. And I was really fortunate to be able to tour a number of you um, over this exhibition and the preceding exhibition over the last couple of months as we celebrated um, what I think are some of the most powerful contemporary women artists out there today at Southern Vermont Art Center. Um, and if you haven't been in our exhibition galleries yet, uh, before uh, I turn some of the questions over to Adrian, just a, a view for all of you, a sort of virtual walk through the very unique gallery spaces at Southern Vermont Art Center. Uh, the slide that you see up is kind of a behind the scenes shot of Adrian um, in the midst of her work. Um, but the exhibition is really divided into two halves. Um, one of the exhibitions features Adrienne's work, Holding Space, um, which you see here, and we'll certainly talk more in depth about that project, um, the works that you see and the works that we couldn't fit into the exhibition. And then if you know the architecture of our gallery space across the hall, um, so to speak, is um, the second gallery, almost equal in size, almost a mirror image, um, focusing um, on the project, uh, the color project, Adrian's, um, another body of Adrian's work, but certainly not the only one. Um, so Adrian, I, I wanna sort of let the audience know a little bit more about you. And as, as we're focusing on two bodies of your work, um, they're photographic, of course, but your training is broad and, and varied from a degree in computer animation to art and art history studies in London and Florence. Can you talk a little bit about how your artistic journey brought you to photography? Sure. Um, first of all, hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm so psyched you're here. I'm so sad I couldn't be there. Um, but this is actually much cooler because then, you know, like people that are all spread out um, can check this out. Um, but yeah, a little about me. So I guess I definitely didn't um, think I was going to be a photographer. I've always been very artistically minded. Um, even when I was young, my parents you know, tried to, you know, find something I would be interested in and really nourish that. So I did, you know, some music lessons that did not stick. <laughs> Piano was like my nightmare. Um, and I did a few things here and there and I took an art class. I know I'm kind of going off, but I'll never forget my first art teacher's name was Zena. And it was just this wonderful woman. And I would go over after school and just kind of do arts and crafts. And that literally stuck with me. It was a lot of like, building things with your hands and drawing. And that's always kind of been my favorite part of creating work. Um, and when I did computer animation in college, I loved the storytelling element of it, but I, I really hated being in front of a screen all day and not being able to just, you know, put my hands in it. So that's kind of a little bit how I combined. And then I studied art history just because I've always, you know, and infatuated with art and the history and how it shows the history and I kind of put everything together um, with building large-scale sets and then staging narrative scenes in them which is the color project which is the, the biggest project at that time that I started um, but actually a Vermont story how I got into photography 
because I, I really didn't know I always loved taking photos, but I never have actually taken a photography class. Um, I was very much self-taught, but um, I was going through kind of a rough time in my life and some friends of mine that were in a band, actually a very beloved Vermont band, um, Grace Potter and the Nocturnals, when they were just starting out, they were like, come on the road and like take pictures with us. And it was just an excuse to get me out of the house because, you know, I was like going through a breakup and very depressed and in my twenties. Um, but it was amazing and it really changed my life. Just kind of taking photos for a living and realizing that it just genuinely made me so happy. And then, you know, I just kind of put my, started to put my own interest in art into that medium. And that's, where I am now. <laughs> okay, right. Um, well, it's possible one of the uh, potters will join on the call later. So we'll do a shout out if that happens and, and sort of retell the story of how that connected us. Um, but in the meantime, you, you sort of talked a little bit about the, um, the love of art history. And I think that's going to come through in, in just a moment. Um, now, you know, for our audience, we're showing, you know, your, what you call your personal work. So the things that really inspire you, the things that you've created on your own. Um, and those uh, bodies of work, those photographs have been shown uh, in museums and galleries really worldwide, including, you know, the Florence Griswold Museum, um, and the Lyman Allen Museums in Connecticut, the Edward Hopper Museum, the Coral Gables Museum in Florida. I mean, I could go on and on. Um, but one thing that um, our visitors and certainly most other museum goers won't see is a really interesting aspect of your work, Adrian. Um, and I'll, I'll advance a little bit. So wondering if you would talk a bit about the commercial side of your work. Um, and I'm pulling up an image here, I believe, from the Badgley Mishka campaign. Is that right? Yes. Um, well, commercial work is actually very exciting for me because I'm, I'm very niche in what I do. So I would never really get hired to do just classic photography. So companies come to me when they kind of want my ideas and my input. Um, so it's really dreamy when that happens. So example, this is the Bagley Mishka. This was last year um, for their bridal campaign. They came to me and said, what would you do? And, you know, I thought about it and I love the idea of contrast. There's a lot of contrast in my work, you know, thematically um, and visually. But so this, we kind of built in this warehouse, we built a little forest and I wanted you to very much be able to see that it was in a warehouse and it was a backdrop, but also get a little lost with the lighting mm -hmm. and not actually be sure where you are. Um, but yeah, in my commercial work, that's kind of where it stems from. It still comes from a very like whimsical place. Um, another thing in my work is I really try not to do any Photoshop. Um, I really love the hands-on aspect of it. I think it takes the work to a completely different level. Um, you know, when you composite a bunch of things together, it can be beautiful, but I, I, I just think so much is lost. Um, so that's another reason why companies sometimes come to me because it's different than these really kind of, you know, composited, orchestrated, Photoshopped things. And I'll show another image just to give people a, a full sense of, of that campaign um, and, uh, and even the set here for uh, the Phillips Disney. And Adrian, I'm, I'm willing to bet that some of the people on our talk today um, are, if not photographers themselves, certainly photography aficionados, and probably most of them um, can do a bit better than I can and just, you know, by holding your iPhone straight. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk, you said, you know, you didn't use, you tried not to use Photoshop in, in much of your work and you're really creating the image in real life. Can you talk a little bit more about your photographic process and tools? Yeah, um, so this one's actually a funny image to say I don't do Photoshop because <laughs> this guy is obviously Photoshop, but we built this whole thing and actually the world behind we built, we had all these flowers coming up. We even hung that little book with all the butterflies coming out from the ceiling. So most of it is real, but you know, the monster guy was obviously plugged in there. 
Um, but my photographic process, uh, like I mentioned before, I was never um, like formally trained as a photographer, so I'm not that techy. Um, but I'm very happy to talk about the gear that I do use. Um, I'm definitely a Canon girl. My dad, um, he always had Canons. He loves photography and that was just kind of mentally inherited to me. So I love Canons. Um, I, on bigger jobs like this, I use a phase one camera, which is a medium format digital camera. So you can take an image like this and you can put it on the side of a building and it'll be huge. Um, most like starting off i really a lot a lot of my work was all natural light maybe with just a couple little accent lights and to be very honest it was because i wasn't really comfortable using strobes because i'd never been formally taught and through the years i've learned but i still would much rather use natural light or even just little accent lights like i think you'll you'll see in my other work um light has kind of become a character in a lot of my stories or my pieces. Um, and a lot of the time, technically wise, I actually usually use constant light because I like to see what it looks like. And I, I use a lot of like smoke machines and haze and you can really see how it interacts with the light when it's just constantly there. So I use um, LED panels. I work closely with a company called K5600 Lighting and they make um, lighting for movies. So sometimes I get to use, they have these like amazing, it's called a joker, it's like a big spotlight and that's my favorite light. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, as far as the photography part, and please ask me questions afterwards, you know, cause I might be missing things, but, and then in post-production, um, I use Adobe. I put everything into Lightroom and that's kind of how I organize. And then in Photoshop, I do definitely tweak like contrast and color sometimes and kind of get the mood that I'm looking for. Um, yeah, and I think that's my process. <laughs> right, right. Um, um, well, Adrian, while we talk about sort of your, you know, the other side of your work, your commercial work, I mean, certainly um, working with particular brands is, is one branch of that. But um, for our audience here, I want to share some of the portraits that you've done, which um, are just incredibly rich and artistic expressions uh, in and of themselves. And, and I've heard you, you know, for many years, call yourself a, a visual storyteller. Um, and so as I, I flip through um, a couple of these um, amazing portraits, and then I'll, I'll sort of flip back, I, I'm wondering if you can talk about this process a little bit and how how you work with a client yeah um actually these kinds of jobs are my absolute favorite jobs um i've been lucky enough to work with some people that have kind of just been like give me some ideas and then i get to go in and create these things so this was a family that actually lived in europe and they contacted me and said we love your work um we want you to come to the house and create an installation and will you just you know what do you think about that? And I said, that sounds amazing. So for this kind of work, I'll put together a proposal of four or five different ideas and see what the family likes. I'll usually ask questions too, to say, you know, do you have favorite stories? Do they, do the kids enjoy this? Do you want the whole family in it? Da, da, da. So example, this family really loved, um, I think it was the mother's favorite was Alice in Wonderland. And so this kind of, the idea of this is there, the kids are looking down the rabbit hole. Um, so I actually flew over there with my team and we built all these flowers on site, like in their yard over a couple days and then built this whole installation. And then the family came back and I rented these taxidermy guys from like a prop house in London. <laughs> I mean, it was a whole thing and it was so much fun. That was one of my favorite projects, but that's what I do for these more kind of large scale, um, conceptual portraits. Right. And I think, you know, it, it, it bears repeating, you know, that this isn't photoshopped. This is an entire set 
yeah, um, both there. realistic and sort of fantasy sets combined in into one. And if, if I may, Adrian, I'd love to flip to some of the um, art historical inspired portraits oh, yeah. because I just think they're so, you know, um, the nod to Vermeer's girl with a pearl earring here. Um, or my, I will admit, my personal favorite is the Frida Kahlo riff. <laughs> I, I mean, I love these. There's a family that I work with a lot and um, I do portraits of them every year and they're themed. Um, and they, they're so much fun to work with that I've actually seen their family like grow up. So I have all these really fabulous themed photos of them. But this one this year, they wanted to do paintings that they loved. Um, and this is the mom. I have an amazing team that I work with that does costumes and props. Um, the, uh, the ribbons, we actually blew up the original painting and printed it out and then cut them out so that they're actually 2D ribbons that we just placed on top of her as well as the monkey. Um, and we made the shirt and then the backdrop is fabric that we found. Um, but that's kind of how I do a lot of these things. I work with some really, awesome people that um, help me with, you know, costumes and props and all that stuff. But this was very fun. And the last, <clears throat> the last pictures with the flowers, just like a fun side fact, we did it right before Christmas and they left them up for like two months and they had a party and all their friends came in and like took pictures of the flowers. So it was cool. It's kind of like an art installation that you can invite people to, you know, wander around in. I have a feeling you're going to be getting a lot of calls after this talk, but um, at any rate, we'll, we'll keep going and um, just wanted to, to show one other and, and people will now recognize, um, Adrian, that th this is you um, and talk a little bit about sort of, you know, your, um, your self-portraits and your, your self-designed sets, why you place yourself in this way. Um, well, this is actually an interesting one. This um, is in Cape Cod, which is where I quarantined with um, my partner, my boyfriend. And uh, this was like month three or something. And um, I was starting to go nuts because, you know, we're in quarantine and he's the most wonderful man. He was like, why don't you just, you know, build sets in here? And I was like, I can't build sets in here. We live here. And it's so, it's a tiny little space. Like this is our living room. The TV is usually right in front of there. And then the, our dining table and just like everything is like one room. And then there's a couple little um, bedrooms. But for the next two months, I just, I built installations in our living space. So we would eat in here and live in here. And um, it was absolutely wonderful. It kind of you know, pulled me out of the depression that everybody was feeling in that time, this crazy weird time. Um, I also just noticed I'm wearing the same exact shirt that I am. In that photo. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is this. So also during that time, you know, I didn't have any people that I could really photograph. So I did a lot of self portraits in these spaces. Um, another fun side fact or point about this is I'm really into collaboration. There's so many amazing artists out there and it's so fun to work with them. So, you know, during lockdown, when you're spending a million hours just looking at things online, I found this textile artist that lives in Italy and I contacted her and said, do you have any interest in doing a collaboration? And she said, yes, that sounds great. I've been in lockdown, you know, they were in lockdown forever. So I asked if she would um, make me a grasshopper. So this grasshopper, she hand sewed. Um, and I'll, I'll give you her info so we could put it somewhere so people could go look at hers. But um, she was amazing. And now I've, I use that guy all the time. We call him Hopper. But <laughs> so this is kind of like a lockdown collaboration. I found a sod farm and like brought sod into the house. There's plastic under it, but. Yeah, so that's, a, that's that picture. <laughs> wow, amazing. Um, well, I'd like to move on to holding space. And um, a, a number of our audience members have, have been through the exhibition, but if they haven't, um, or if they need a reminder, Adrienne's uh, project, Holding Space, is one where she gains permission to go into the historic homes of artists and writers um, and creates a set um, sometimes with models, not exclusively, depending on the kind of story that she wants to 
to, to tell. Um, and really through these sets and these narratives, you're, you're giving these homes and often their former residents uh, a new life. And so, um, of course, we couldn't possibly fit every single um, home that you photographed in the exhibition at SVAC, but one that we're looking at here, uh, which I think will be a treat for those who have seen our exhibition, is the Mark Twain house. Um, so here is the exterior, and I think um, possibly even more wonderfully is an, an interior shot. And I'm wondering if you can just kind of talk about how you create this, this story um, or what's behind this in the Mark Twain house. Yeah, um, so this is the Mark Twain house that's in Hartford, Connecticut. I think he's got a couple, um, but this was where he was like in his glory days and he was with his family. And um, all the images that I try to do for this entire project, all the narratives that have people in them, I do a lot of research on the work and you know the personal life and kind of what has inspired them and kind of who they are and then I tried to build narratives around that. So this image was in um, the library and apparently, I mean, he seems like he was the most amazing father of all time, but he had um, daughters and they would play this game every night before they went to bed where he would go um, down all of the objects on the mantle and make up different stories every night. And they would always start with, I'm not sure if you can see, but those two paintings, the tiny little paintings on the right, one of them is a cat with a rough collar. And it would always start with the cat and then it would end with the woman on the left who is kind of in like a black veil. And that was their childhood bedtime stories every night was Mark Twain making things up. So I just thought that was the most amazing story in itself and I wanted to pay homage to it. So this is my little nod. Um, the woman on the right is wearing a rough collar and a cat mask. And actually one of these stories has been published and um, in it involves um, a lion that is able to talk to people. So that's kind of a nod um, to that story is the character on the left. All right, we'll, we'll move to um, another. Um, and uh, this image actually isn't in the show, but we're, we're looking now at the Wentworth Wood House. Um, and we have um, almost a wall in our galleries of photos from, from this home that you, that you did. Um, it, it, an, an enormous English Baroque mansion with over 300 rooms and what, 250,000 square feet, something outrageous like that. Um, with a very storied history. I mean, there, there are tales of um, supernatural occurrences and illicit love affairs and British nobility lived in it and uh, all kinds of political um, intrigue happened there. Um, but that's not what, you're not the historian, Adrian. You, you came to this as an artist, um, not a historian. And so, you know, what, um, what attracted you to this crazy, wacky home and, and what kind of narrative did you create in it? Um, well, this was kind of what started everything in terms of me kind of going a little bit away from full set design to falling in love with spaces and kind of using pre-existing spaces as my sets. Um, like you said, I, I studied art history in London for a while. And um, one of my dear friends a few times went to his friend's house for the weekend. And he was always like, you should come. And I was like, nah, nah, nah. Like, I'm in London. I'm never leaving. <laughs> I don't want to go in a country. Um, which was ridiculous because then I saw photos and it turns out it was this house, um, which was crazy. So um, over the next few years after I had left and come back, it just kept haunting me. I want to photograph this place. I really want to go. So I finally got up the courage to get in touch with the owner who turned out to be the nicest person in the world and uh, was open to me coming with my team for two weeks and living and working in the house. Um, at this time, it was privately owned. It's now been sold to the National Trust. So now they have tours and all this stuff. But at that time, it was very, very empty, and he had inherited this house and was living there basically alone um, with a caretaker and all of his dogs. These are all of his whippets. So um, 
It's actually a cool story. I brought three of my very close friends. I, I went twice. The first time I brought three or four of my close friends. And then the second time I brought my boyfriend, my sister, and my best friend from college. And just the four of us um, did that film, which is in the show, um, and a lot of the photos that were in the show. Um, and then the themes that I really wanted to explore in this space was just light and shadow um, and kind of the relationship and the emotions that those bring up in different people and you know what we could just play with in that space and create narratives just with those two elements being the main focus and of course the house being a character in itself. Right, and I'll, I'll, I'm sharing a second image from that um, that series as you talk about sort of the house being a character and and focusing on uh, on light and shadow and atmosphere. I think that's perfectly appropriate as we um, look at this amazing um, sort of almost ethereal image here. And um, Adrian, at the risk of not following um, chronological order in um, in the you know in the uh, holding space series, um, I'm going to flip to. Uh, the Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock house. Um, so as another um, historic home of, of artists, uh, this one has a really sort of heartbreaking and, and poignant story, um, almost more about Lee than about, about Lee Krasner than about Jackson Pollock. Um, and I think um, I'll, I'll land on this image just for, for those who, you know, want to kind of refresher. It's the home. Um, of abstract expressionist painter Jackson Pollock, um, who really sort of rose uh, meteorically in the art world in the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s, and his, um, I will share my bias and say, equally talented painter um, wife, Lee Krasner, um, who just never quite, um, even today, became the household name uh, that he did. And I think it was a particularly um, interesting, when we were planning this exhibition, particularly interesting to uh, focus a little bit on um, Lee, not only focusing on you as an artist, but also focusing on you um, depicting another uh, female artist. And I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about, you know, recreating their story. Yeah, um, I mean, this was a dream for me. The second I decided that I wanted to kind of concentrate on the historic homes of artists and writers, this was an absolute dream. And the people that run the museum there were amazing. Um, just in terms of technique and putting together this um, this project, this, this is the first one that was a little bit of a departure. Um, I actually did casting for this, so the, um, the man who played Pollock and the woman that plays Krasner um, are actually actors that I found that were really interested in the project. And then I had a, um, a, a, a cinematographer come and help me shoot my short film. So it was a much higher production level from all the other things I've done. Um, but the narrative in itself, I really kind of just wanted to play on the, the tension and also the respect, mostly, you know, she is fascinating. She was so just kind of like up and coming and hip and awesome with all the women in New York at that time. And, you know, they met and she kind of put everything on pause. Um, I can't remember if we have that picture in here, but one of the pictures, yeah. Um, they, this picture is kind of just about how she played every role for him. You know, she was his manager, she was his friend, she was his lover, she was his mother, you know, and he was just kind of drinking and painting in his cowboy way. So um, I, I wanted to really kind of dive into their relationship a lot and kind of um, the, the short film is called Abstract Expression and I feel like that's kind of how they were with each other. You know, it was almost kind of like a, a mess, um, but full of emotion, you know, like his work. Right. It's a, I think it's a really powerful, powerful series and a, and a deeper dive 
um, for many of us, a deeper dive into uh, the relationship with with Lee um, and really just thinking about, you know, how difficult it was for her to make her way as an artist and be supportive of someone like Jackson. Yeah. Um, something that I do think is fascinating is after, you know, we see the, um, the studio and the studio floor and how, you know, amazing it is. And you're like, oh, it's Jackson Pollock studio. But after he passed away, she stayed in this house um, and she ended up turning it into her studio as well. So it's, it's really fascinating being in that space, just thinking about the different energies that were in there, how much went on. Um, if anybody ever gets a chance to visit this space, it's really amazing because she lived in there until she passed and then the next week they turned it into a museum. So all the books on the shelves, like the curator we even show you, like you could pull open the um, little bedside table and there's just all random stuff in there that um, was theirs. There's like cigarettes and like, you know, buttons or whatever is in there. I can't remember. <laughs> but it's a really, really cool, fascinating space that's just kind of held in time. Yeah. Well, to continue kind of the, the last segment of um, the Holding Space exhibition at SVAC and to really kind of continue the narrative of um, a woman photographer taking, um, taking on the narrative of another um, female photographer, I think the Alice Austin house, um, I will fully admit was a story I didn't know at all. Um, and is probably one of my favorite um, parts of the exhibition. Although I, I, I change my mind every time I start talking about another work as, as much of the audience knows. <laughs> um, but, but this must have been so um, meaningful for you to kind of um, get to know Alice Austin and her sort of heartbreaking story of, of success and, and failure and love and, and heartbreak. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your experience there? Yeah, so um, Alice Austin was a female photographer that lived on Staten Island around um, like Victorian era. And uh, she was gay and she lived there with her partner, partner Gertrude. Um, and it was at a time where, you know, that wasn't really a, a thing, you know, that you were, I don't, it just wasn't really a thing. And um, this image particularly um, kind of breaks my heart. It's really beautiful. So I guess they met um, at a weekend, like a family friend's weekend getaway. And at that point, I, I really can't remember, which is terrible, but Gertrude was sick and the medication she was taking, her hair had fallen out. So she had a wig on and um, Alice asked if she could take her picture. And she said, you know, okay. And then she also asked if she could take a picture without her wig on. And that was just their first meeting. And I feel like love at first sight, feeling so vulnerable with someone that you trust them to like take your wig off and let them photograph you. I just thought that was really beautiful. So I wanted to kind of pay homage to that. Um, the rest of the story that is um, a little sad is, you know, the depression came and she lost everything, absolutely everything. And they had to leave the house, sell off everything. They tried to keep it, keep the house for a while as like a tea room. And I think at one point it was like a school or ballet school or something, I can't remember. Um, and Alice ended up having to go to like a poor house and Gertrude went to go live with her family. And really, I think Alice at that point just kind of, you know, zoned out and was, you know, she was a very old woman and went from being very wealthy her whole life to having nothing and being in this poor house. And it's kind of incredible. I think, um, a journalist or something discovered all of her negatives that had been taken out of the house and put into the basement of like the local historical society. And he was like, these are fascinating who took these and he found her and showed them to her. And I think in my brain, I picture her just kind of like coming to and being like, these are my photos. And he was able to sell them and get her out of the poorhouse. Um, it, it almost like makes me tear up just thinking about it. So. And she was able to go back and visit the house one last time. And then she was put in a proper nursing home. And um, 
you know, she passed after that, but her work saved her in a way, which I just think is so beautiful. Um, so it's a beautiful and absolutely devastatingly heartbreaking story um, all at the same time. I just think that she's awesome. <laughs> Um, I agree. And I think it's it's one of the stories that I've really enjoyed uh, telling as I walk people through the galleries. And I think it's it's sort of, uh, you know, as you get used to touring it, it's the, the last kind of stop on on the holding space. We, we look at um, the image here where your model, who is uh, Alice, is holding a glass, the, one of the actual glass negatives. That's right. Yeah, I think that, I mean, it's an actual glass negative. I think that they copied it, I think, um, because this one they let it's us- It's from her glass stuff. negative, yeah. And usually in historic homes, I like bring in my own chair and all this stuff because right. you can't touch anything. Right. Um, but it, this is, a, you know, the negative, which is just so cool. Which inspires this image. Yes. Um, which it, for those of you who haven't seen the exhibition, um, is just a, a, a very, very powerful image. It's, uh, I don't have the dimensions in front of me, but certainly over life size. It entirely holds the room. It's the first line of sight all the way across the gallery when you walk into it. Um, and really very striking. It's also been kind of the signature image on um, our publication and signage just because it's, it's so striking. Um, and, and before we move on to the next um, sort of body of work, Adrian, um, there are so many homes out there of, of artists and writers. Not everyone has been preserved, obviously, but, but many are left. Um, is there anything you have your eye on? I mean, yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm actually shooting at the Hopper House in Nyack um, very soon. Um, and I'm in talks with the Emily Dickinson Museum, which I'm very excited about. Um, and then a dream one, which I will do, is um, the Dali Museum over in Spain. So there's, I mean, there's a ton that I really want. I have a massive list. So um, I think I'm, I'm just still so infatuated and in love with this project. So I think this is going to be very ongoing for a long time. Right. So folks, you, you heard it here. We, there's much more work to show in future years uh, when we do part two. Um, <laughs> uh, but Adrian, as we sort of fast forward into the present or perhaps even sort of future, um, you know, as, as we literally um, or virtually walk across the hallway into the next gallery, um, we, we move into a space that has kind of this magical journey through color. And I think certainly it's, it's better for you to tell the story um, than for me, but I'll just introduce the color project here um, and your, uh, your heroine here, Annie, um, who wakes up one day to find, um, or, or should I say, once upon a time, there was a young girl named Annie, and she woke up to find. Uh, what happens here? Um, well, the story goes, she wakes up, and all the colors have disappeared. Um, and so, you know, the concept was just that she has to travel and find all the different colors and bring them back together. Um, and just through that simple story, I'm hoping that it shows a little bit of self-discovery um, and kind of like a young woman coming into her own. Um, it actually took me over three years to shoot this. So you can see her grow up. So by the end, I think we started when she was, you know, six-ish and we ended when she was almost 10. So you can really see the difference. Um, and her name really is Annie. And um, she's been, I, I did a, the project after this or a couple years after this, I did a whole fairy tale series and she was my Snow White. Um, and I'm still close with her and her family. They're like the sweetest people, but um, that's kind of the story. Um, in putting this together, it was, this is one of, this is not one of, this is my first big project. Um, and I was in a friend's uh, nursery and she was a first time mom and she had, it was all just like very clean. Everything was white and she was just, you know, very particular that everything in there was going to be white. And I just remember 
kind of just thinking how beautiful that was and what a wonderful story that would be as like a first chapter. And then I was like, oh, I'll do every color. And then I just kind of went nuts. And this project um, is near and dear to my heart because it kind of introduced me to my, my team that I still work with, but also that it was, it was a very community-based project. I funded this through a Kickstarter. So, um, you know, I raised money to be able to get all these props and to pay people and to get it all together. And then I sent everybody prints. Um, but also I would go on social media and Facebook and just be like, all right, guys, when you think of red, what do you think of? And I would get just tons of answers. And it was so cool because it was, it was things I didn't think of. And um, it just felt like a, like a big project that was just much bigger than me. Um, and I had so many people that would just come in and volunteer and be like, who wants arts and crafts day? And just come in and like cut, you know, in the orange world, we cut all of those, um, or are they over here? Um, all the leaves <laughs> out of construction paper. So um, it took a lot of hands and a lot of it was donated time of just people that wanted a creative outlet and were excited about something just like pure and simple and lovely. So um, this project makes me smile for so many reasons. I love the, you know, what we produced, but I also love how we produced it. Mm -hmm. And um, again, we built all this. So uh, sorry, one last thing we had, um, a room that I built in my studio, which was just like three walls, a back wall and two sides. Um, and we just, every time, you know, we shot and finished, it would be devastating. We would have to like take the whole thing down. And then once you emotionally recovered from like taking that whole thing down, we'd come back a few weeks later and start again on the next color. So, um, you know, those three walls housed this whole project. And that, that's my sister's little dog that was in all of the pictures too. <laughs> ah, okay, and and I want to just be sure we we take everybody through the color through the rainbow here as we move from yellow. And of course, what we're what we're not showing on the screen today is that there are multiple multiple shots in every single color, and from color to color, there's a transition moment. So Annie finds a way to enter the portal, whatever the portal may be from you know red to orange and yellow to green and green to to blue um and, and you infuse humor in some of these i imagine little inside jokes as annie is with a school of fish um and and she's studying here um and i think one of the the most um at least it looks like one of the most ambitious um color worlds here is is purple this kind of amethyst um, other planet uh, that she that she wakes up in or or finds herself in, I should say. Um, yeah, this it's funny because this is so simple, but it took us forever. Um, it was supposed to be, or it is a um, wisteria tree, and we made it all out of tissue paper, and then you know wove purple lights in it. But I did not realize how long that was going to take because it was so, I was like, purple's going to be so quick. We're just going to do a wisteria tree. I'm like, weeks later, they were like, Adrian, <laughs> there's got to be a simpler way to do this, which there may have been, but I really, I really enjoyed how it turned out. Right. And then I'll, I'll just linger on the last image that kind of pulls it all together, which is um, really such a, a beautiful image here that, that shows the whole rainbow of color. Um, and I know for you, it's, it was really about this beautiful children's story, but people can take it on so many different levels um, about whether it's self-discovery, whether it's about color, you know, with meaning literal or figurative and, and isn't the world richer when uh, there is color in it um, is, is something that the audience has kind of taken away from it uh, away, you know, during some of our, our talks and tours, um, giving it a, a kind of life of its own. Uh, but as I, I look at our clock here, um, it's not hard to talk for an hour, and I want to be sure to give um, people time to ask questions. So let me see if I can uh, stop the, the screen share. And um, 
I think I've, I've got um, everyone here. And then in the chat, um, let's see, I think we're, we're, oh, we've got lots of, lots and lots of, of questions here. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, it, Judy asks a, a great one. Um, where, where else can we see your work? Have you published a book? Um, or is that on the horizon? I think that's kind of the, the question uh, that Judy's getting at. Yeah, so um, I mean, the initial dream for the color project was for it to be a children's book. So that's always on the horizon in my brain. Um, I need to get that rolling. <laughs> um, I've been working with people and trying to put it out, but you know, I got to find the right publisher for that. So hopefully the color project will come out as a children's book. Um, I am planning on having the um, holding space series as a book, but I'm just, I'm not ready yet. I want there to be like many, many more chapters. Um, you can see my work at the Southern Vermont Art Center. <laughs> and, and already in the chat, we have suggestions. Please come back and show your future work. Uh, and that's echoed um, by, by many people through the chat. So, um, you know, it's, it's funny, Adrian, uh, we've kind of known you for a number of years, few, uh, you know, through a mutual friend. Um, this is the first time we, we got to work together really individually. Um, but absolutely, hopefully, it's, it's not the last. I'll, I'll throw out just a couple of more uh, questions and, and comments. Um, uh, it, Maxine makes a, a wonderful comment, both to you and everyone. Um, she played Charlotte Bronte um, in an off-Broadway play, and the, the Bronte home in Yorkshire um, is now a museum, um, and just sort of putting it out there for um, future fodder for holding space. So I see um, uh, an SVAC UK edition with both um, visual and performing arts is is coming along. Um, and, and another um, sort of question um, from, from Marianne to you about uh, Mark Twain's Adam and Eve. And I don't know if you have read that, but there's a suggestion to um, to maybe uh, take a look at that, take a read if we continue in quarantine for a little while, um, as, as we may, and it may provide more fodder if, if you go back to um, the Mark Twain house. So. Um, um, I actually am going back to Mark Twain house in January, um, which I'm excited about. Um, I'm not sure, I, I just bought a book of Mark Twain's called, um, oh my goodness, I'm so not gonna remember, like Letters from, I'm not sure, but I think it's his take on Adam and Eve, so it could be the same thing, which is so random. I mean, he's written so much, so there's no way I know everything, but um, I love suggestions of interesting stories that I could you know, narrate in the space. I'm so open to that, so I'll look into that for sure. If you wanna right. send me that, that'd be awesome too. Right. Well, we are coming to sort of the end of our afternoon and, and heading into um, the, the dinner hour. And, and while no one has um, any, any places or, or gatherings to go to these days, uh, <laughs> I want to be respectful of everyone's time nonetheless. Um, and Adrian, we, um, on behalf of, of SVAC and our audience, want to say a huge, huge thank you to you. Um, we have so enjoyed hearing the insights of, of your work um, and talking with you, and of course, also seeing your work. Um, and uh, for those of you who haven't seen the exhibition in person, if you are local and if you can, um, see it while we're open and, and it will be um, if all continues to go well, um, we'll be on view through November 29th. So please come visit us. Um, if you want a, a private look at it, uh, Allison or I are happy, um, absolutely happy to arrange that. Um, and all of you who attended, um, of course, we will be sending out a survey. We love to get feedback on our programs and what other kinds of things you want to uh, see and participate in. 
Um, and I will just say, you know, for all of you in the audience, if there's a question that you didn't want to ask in the public forum here or things that you want to share with Adrian or other things that you want to know, um, feel free to send that to me um, or to Allison, if, wh whomever is, is fine, and we'll, we'll share those. So um, I'm sure that Adrian would love to hear the suggestions and, and any other questions that she might be able to answer offline, um, if, that's, if that's appropriate. Yeah. Yes. So thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, stay well, everyone. Uh, be careful out there. We hope to see you when things open up. Um, and Adrian, we really, really hope to welcome you back um, for another project, whatever it is um, no, at SBAC. Yes, this is awesome. Thank you so much. This was, this was a pleasure.